and welcome to Grace Life Online. We are so excited that you could join us today. Yeah, we hope you guys have had a good week. And just before we jump in, we just wanna let you guys know about three things to help improve the online experience. And number one is actually engaging in worship. Let's make sure yeah. that we're jumping up, that we're not just sitting down, that we're jumping up, singing, and actually worshiping to God. Number two, take notes. Go grab a pen, grab a notebook write down what you're hearing you know this is a really good way to have something to meditate on and pray on during the week really understand what god is saying to you 
Yeah, and on that, number three is let's make sure that we're still listening to God. Oh, yeah. You know, no matter where you're streaming from, whether it's the kitchen, the bathroom, your bedroom, wherever it is, God's still speaking to us in this time. So let's make sure we're listening in. Absolutely. And kids, if you missed it this morning at nine o'clock, we had our first episode of Grace Life Kids TV. Don't worry, you can catch up on the app. And next Sunday and every Sunday after that, we are going to be having Grace Life Kids TV. So parents and kids, be sure to tune in at nine o'clock through the Grace Life Community and Connect group. Yeah, and that's a private group that we have for the family here at Grace Life. So if you're not part of that, make sure that you jump in on it because you need to be in there. All right, and other than that, all I can say is go to the toilet now yeah. and we'll see you guys after the service. Good morning, Grace Life, and everyone who's joining us today. I pray that you would have an amazing church service in your home. If you would like to stand up and pray with us. Father, 
we love you so much today and we pray that you would be blessed by our worship and our praise, Jesus. Be exalted in the middle of everything we do and everything we say. And Holy Spirit, you are so welcome in our midst. Amen. Sing, you let me out. You let me out of the desert. You brought me into his streams, the river of living water. Turn my bitter into sweet, all my burdens are lifted. You took the shackles off my feet, but there's no sound louder than the captive set free. No, there's no sound louder than the captive set free. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. much to give him praise for and um, even in the middle of the world events that are happening in the middle of isolation God is at work I felt like the, the Lord said to me this morning for someone that's in this service today that you were born for such a time as this in the middle of COVID-19 you were born for such a time as this and um those words God spoke over Queen Esther to remind her that he always has a plan. And so for you this morning, God has a plan. And um, we want to introduce a new song. We want to sing it over you and we want you to sing it with us. It's called The Blessing. And the words of this song are the words that Moses declared over the royal priesthood who were going through some pretty challenging times. And so we want to sing these words and declare them over you this morning, over your life and your circumstances. 
And could you please join us and declare these words over yourself, over your family, over your neighbours, over our nation and the nations of the world. Let's declare the word of God together. Amen.
even as we worship this morning, God's face is shining towards you. His eyes are upon you. He's looking to you. His presence is with us wherever we are this morning. And I want to encourage us to really lean into His presence. Don't make this about some sort of online experience. We're seeking after in-house encounters. Encounters with the living God. A God who transcends time, geographical locations. A God whose spirit can move right now and minister in your home. And we're not calling each other to be spectators, but to be engaged in what the presence of God is doing right now. And as the team's been ministering this song this morning about the blessing being released over and into you, let's make some time right where we are to pray that over each other, that our homes, that our marriages, that our families, that our neighborhoods, that our communities, that our nation would be a place of the blessing of God, that it would be a place that is known for the presence of God. And so I'm going to invite us wherever we are to just, if you're in a room with someone else, to go and sit with them. Husbands, sit with wives, children, bring them in. And we're going to pray for each other. If you're watching alone, if you're watching at home, I'm going to ask you to just bring someone into your mind, into your heart right now that you can pray blessing over. Maybe it's your neighbors. Maybe it's family members. Perhaps it's someone uh, that, that came into your life a long time ago. We're going to pray blessing and release blessing over each other. Maybe you can hold hands or put your hand on someone's shoulder. But right now, our homes are becoming spaces of grace where the blessing of God is being released. And I'm going to pray for us. And I, I call you to pray with me as we pray. And if you don't have words to pray, then pr just simply pray this. God, bless them. God, bless them. Let's pray right now and release God's blessing over one another. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you that it is your heart right now to release your blessing in its richest and truest form in our lives to release your blessing over our families, to release your blessing over our children and over our children's children to come. Father, to release your blessing into our homes and into our workplaces and into our neighborhoods. May the blessing and the favor of God mark us as a people. We pray right now for those that are on our hearts, those that we're not in, in um, proximity of, but God, we bring them to you. We bring them to your throne room. And we ask for your blessing to be released in their lives. We pray for our parents. We pray for our children. We pray for our husbands and our wives, God. And we release blessing and favor. May your face continually shine upon them. And God, may they know the goodness and mercy would follow them all the days of their lives. We thank you for your presence. You know no limit. You know no bound. And right now, manifesting yourself in homes. We thank you for your presence that changes us and transforms us. God, we thank you for your presence that marks us and makes us to never be the same again. And we pray that this morning would be like one of those moments where you change, where breakthrough comes because of your presence, not because of the polish of our service, but because of the presence of God that is right now moving upon people's hearts and breaking off chains and bringing freedom and liberty and setting people free. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, God. Oh, we thank you for the blessing that adds no sorrow. We thank you for the blessing that changes people's lives. We honor you right now in every home, in every place of gathering. We honor the name of Jesus. We lift high the name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name, the name that is above every sickness and disease, the name that is so powerful, the name that brings redemption, the name that brings transformation, the name that brings healing. We, we gather under the name of Jesus, regardless of where we are, we're under the name of Jesus together. And we honor the name of Jesus. Let your name 
be lifted high in our lives, in our hearts, in our homes. God, we honor you this morning. We thank you this morning. Oh, we are so grateful for your presence. We are so grateful for your presence. Amen and amen and amen. We are so grateful for your presence. Man, how good is it to serve a God that is not limited by the restrictions that we are currently facing, but is just as powerful today as he was last week, six months ago, two years ago, and as he will be tomorrow. And I'm so grateful for this disruption. You know, it's caused us to see that church isn't about a building. It's not about the chairs and the stage and the lights. Church is about us engaging together with the presence of God. And right now we get to do that in our homes, together as families. We get to do that online with one another. What an absolute privilege and honor it is for us to encounter the living God. Hey, well, good morning, and let me welcome you this morning to Grace Life Online. It's great to have you with us. And uh, if you're watching from one of our campuses, big hello, big good morning. Uh, if you're from Malaga or Ellenbrook or from Livingston, we really want to welcome you. And to all of our online visitors, wherever you're watching from this morning, whether it's locally or internationally, a big good morning, big g'day if you're overseas. It is great that you have tuned in with us and I uh, hope that you've already been able to experience the presence of God wherever you are. And uh, we really do want to encourage each other in this season while things look different to not miss the blessing of the disruption and the blessing of the, of the change and looking for the lessons that God is teaching us in this. If we haven't met, my name is Scott and I serve here on team at Grace Life. And uh, I also am involved with some of the stuff that happens in our community. And this morning, I want to give a bit of a snapshot and a highlight of what's been happening in our local community. I have been so encouraged that in the midst of a crisis, the church has actually stood up probably like we've never before. We've been uh, putting the call out lately for our volunteers to come and be involved in some of the food distribution that we're doing. And uh, I've got to say that we are at the point now where we have more volunteers than we actually had jobs to give volunteers, which I'm not sure is a, a, a common thing for churches to face where you have a, a, a boom of volunteers more than you have jobs for them to do. But what that actually means for us as a church is that we can now expand our care. And so we've got a great partnership with the city of Swan here in our local area. And uh, I really want to give a shout out to all of the, the councillors and those that work for the city of Swan. In the midst of everything that's taking place, they're doing a great job in trying to care for our community. And we really value and treasure the partnership that we have with them. And they've afforded us a lot of opportunities in this time to be involved with, particularly with food distribution. You would have heard that in the past, that we've opened up our, our, our hubs to, to be able to serve food to the community. And uh, just to reiterate that, on, on a Friday morning and a Saturday morning in our Malaga hub from 10 till 12, we have free bread and free fruit and veg for anyone that comes down. You don't need a referral for that. You can just come down and access that. Uh, thinking, thinking just beyond ourselves, not just for us, but for, for maybe some of our neighbors or family members or people that we know that can't get out of the house. Why not think about them and come down, grab something for them, drop it off to them, show some care for them. And uh, just excited to announce as well that in our Ellenbrook hub, uh, from Monday to Friday, we're going to have a bread table set up with bread and baked goods. There's gonna, this morning, I think there were scones and uh, donuts and all sorts of stuff. So it's not just 14-day-old bread. This is like good stuff that you can, you can give to people and you can eat at home. So that's going to be open right from 9 a.m. every morning, and it's just going to be out all day until it goes. Uh, but if, you're involved, if you want to come and grab some bread uh, for your family, please feel free to do that. But what we're also asking in this time is that we uh, would help to look out for those who are 
uh, vulnerable, for those who can't get out of their homes, uh, for those who, who could really benefit from some extra care. And if you know someone that fits that category, w- we'd love you to send through their details, send, send through their name, so that we can look at how we can get some food to them. And this is the kind of second phase of our, our operation here with the food distribution is uh, we're going to look at taking some of our volunteers and turning them into delivery drivers. And so any food that, that is needed for families that are vulnerable or some of our seniors, we're going to get our delivery drivers to come, pick it up, package it up, and then take it to deliver to them. And a, another exciting thing that I heard just yesterday from the city of Swan is that there's going to be um, cooked, fresh cooked meals available as well. So we're going to be able to access those and get them out to families. But we really want to make sure that we're... we're um, caring for those who are extremely vulnerable at this time. So if you know of anyone, please send through to care at gracelife.com.au and we'll see what we can do to get some rosters up with all of those volunteers. You'll be contacted this week about how you can be involved with that. And if you do want to be a part of that, again, to care at gracelife.com.au, we'd love to hear from you. I I really want to just quickly pray for the work that's taking place in our community right now that In everything that we do, every loaf of bread, every muffin that is given out, that that the name of Jesus would go with it and the presence of Jesus would move with it and the blessing of God would go into homes. So I wonder if we could pray for that right now. Father, we thank you that in a time of crisis, you are calling your people to stand up and we've seen such a response, such a graciousness and a kindness in your people to, to look beyond ourselves. And we just pray right now that you'd continue to give opportunities for that. God, that you'd even put people on our hearts right now that would um, benefit from this service. God, people in our community that don't yet know the good news. And we pray that every loaf of bread that is, is given out is a seed. God, that it's a seed that would bring life and bring redemption. God, that it's a seed that shows care, that shows your presence, that shows you are actually real. That in this time when people are looking for hope, may they find it through, um, through you in your church. We just thank you for these opportunities. I also take time to pray for our city of Swan, for all of the councillors in the area, for all of the staff members in the city of Swan. God, we, pl- we pray your favour upon them. We pray your blessing upon them. We pray that they would come to know you in this and that they would see the light of Jesus as a result of what's taking place. We honor you, God, and we thank you for the the amazing privilege that we get to serve with no strings attached. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So again, if you want to be involved, care at gracelife.com.au. We'd love to hear from you. Now I'm going to throw to church news so we can see what's happening, and then we're going to hear a word from Pastor Josh. Hey Church, we want to welcome you to a brand new Facebook page called Grace Life Community and Connect. This is a private Facebook group for people in the Grace Life family to get better connected, build Christ-centered community and explore ways to help meet need in Jesus' name. If you're part of Grace Life Church and you haven't yet joined up, why not do it today? Hey Church, Alex here. Ministry School is starting again on the 30th of April and we're taking a dive into scripture this term. We're going to be doing hermeneutics, which is the art and science of understanding the Bible, interpreting it and reading it. And then in our second session, we're gonna be taking a deep dive into Galatians. So I'm really looking forward to this. I'm really hoping you can join us. We've managed to get the cost down because everything's online and you know we're not able to eat together. So the cost is going to be $150 for each session. So that's uh, $300 for the whole term. Now, look, if that's still an issue, please come and talk to us. We don't want you to miss out just because of a little bit of money. If you're interested in enrolling or finding out more, contact me at study at gracelife.com.au. I really am looking forward to seeing you there.
Well, good morning. If we haven't yet met, my name is Josh and I get to serve on the leadership team here in Grace Life Church. If you're part of our Malaga congregation, g'day, or our Ellenbrook congregation, g'day. If you're part of our Livingston, Zambia congregation, g'day. So good to be celebrating Jesus with you this morning. Perhaps you're a Christian and you don't have a home church that you can connect with. Please feel free to make yourself right at home, but also lean in to what God is saying to you perhaps today. Maybe you're out there and you don't classify yourself as a Christian. Maybe you call yourself an atheist or an agnostic, or maybe you're a Muslim, or maybe you're a Buddhist. It doesn't really matter. You are absolutely welcome to have a look and see what Christians are talking about. And at the end of the service today, you'll be given an opportunity to say yes to Jesus, or perhaps you want some more information about Jesus. Maybe you want to chat with someone. You're very welcome to join with us on that. If you missed out last Sunday's service, it really was a great one, and I found Pastor Scott's message uh, a bit of a corker, personally. I loved, uh, as we start the series of David, how Pastor Scott broke down the initial life of David from a young age, uh, and I want to just camp there together, if I can. Now, uh, before we get into the anointing of David, you know, before all of that happened in 1 Samuel chapter 8, we can read that um, Israel were getting a little bit jealous. They were without a king and without having a king, they looked at all the other nations and they started to compare themselves to these other nations. And as they're looking at these other nations, they forget that they are made uniquely They were made for God's purposes. And when they took their eyes off God and his purposes, they then start to compare themselves with these other nations and they have a bit of a whinge about it. Any self-confessed whinges out there? Be very careful what you whinge about. Be very careful what you complain about. Be very careful what you even pray for. Here we can see the nation of Israel, without any king at all, started to compare themselves, take their eyes off, off God, and they, they're having an argument with Samuel. Saying, Samuel, we want our own king. Samuel says, look, if you do put your own king, he's not going to be good news for you. And he actually spells out what's going to happen to the nation of Israel. But they didn't care. It says this in verse 19. No, there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all the other nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. They didn't care about the word of God. They cared about themselves. I was talking with um, uh, my Malaysian bodyguard friend, Bunny Lim, uh, just recently. We were out there doing um, some exercise. We are just doing some bog laps, walking around, getting some exercise of Kingsway Reserve. And we're talking about how God has made us very unique and very different. And Bunny Lim, the... uh, Confucius of Malaysia, comes out with this zinger that really stuck with me. He says, comparison is the thief of joy, la. He didn't say la, but he's Malaysian, so I put it in there for effect. He says, comparison is the thief of joy. And I thought that is so very true. How true is it for us as God's people to feel the need to compare ourselves with one another and not see that God has made us unique and that he has specific plans for us in that uniqueness. And then we start to compare ourselves. Oh, I think I need to be like that person. I need more money like that person. I need to be more funny like that person. I need to be better looking like that person. I don't have this and I don't have that. And as we compare ourselves, our insecurities are fed and our joy is killed. Comparison is an absolute killjoy. Israel decide to not listen to the word of God and they want to appoint their own king. We want our own king. Let's make it happen. And what does God do? God gives them what they want. That's one of the worst things you could ever get. God giving you what you want. When he hands us over to ourselves, the judgment of God is God saying, all right, you want it? You got it. You want me out of your schools? You got it. You want me out of your parliament? You got it. You want me off the radio waves? You got it. You want me off the TV? You've got it. And he hands that over to us. But in his mercy at times, he doesn't give us what we want. I'm so grateful that he has not given to me what I prayed for or complained about or whinged about. Be careful what you complain about. God might actually give you what you want. 
So here we see Saul is appointed the first king of Israel and he runs amok. He stuffs it right up. He runs the nation into the ground. Saul is a man that is trying to puff himself up. God didn't want that. He eventually chooses David, who is a man who humbles himself. Saul was a man that was so mindful about what other people thought about him. David was only mindful about what God thought about him. Saul was a man who found his security in himself and his own ego and pride, which is misplaced security, insecurity. David was a man who placed his security in God and not himself, which is true security. I wonder where in our lives are we trying to force something, trying to make something fit that is not God's intention or his plan. So I want to pick up, if we can now, from 1 Samuel, and I'm going to, a few chapters later, in verse 16, chapter 16, I'm going to read verse 1 and 2, and then I'm going to jump through to verses 6 through to verse 13. This is where young David gets anointed as king. He's young, and there's conjecture about whether he's 8 or 9 or 10, or 11 or 12 or 13 or 14. At the roundabout kind of age, he's probably about 12 or 13 years old. He doesn't really know what, what's going on with his life, but God calls for Samuel to forget about Saul and go and approach a man named Jesse who has a stack of sons to which the future king will be found. Let's read this together. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Verse 2 says, And Samuel said, Well, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. He was a very insecure king. Let's go down to verse 6. This is when he's got all the sons before him. When they all came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him now. But the Lord said to Samuel the prophet, Don't look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. I love that God looks at the inside of a person. We can see in 1 Samuel chapter 13, it says, Now your kingdom shall not continue. This is a word to King Saul. Your kingdom will not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord had commanded you. As quickly as someone is appointed to leadership, they can go in the moment, which is why a true indicator of good leadership is the health of the heart. If you want to be a good leader, you've got to have a healthy heart. If you want to be a toxic leader, have a toxic heart. At the end of the day, it all begins and ends with the heart. So God is after a man that is after his own heart, that wants God's own heart. He then is not so interested in how the outward appearance is presented, but he wants to know what's happening on the inside. Verse 8, Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hasn't chosen any of these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, well, there there's remains yet the youngest. But behold, he's keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now David was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, this one, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed David in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. God looks at the inner parts of a person, which is good news. So good news for us. If our hearts are right, his gaze is fixed on us. It doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter what your height is. 
It doesn't matter what your bank balance says. It doesn't matter what people have called you in the past. But if your heart is right, God can do amazing things with a surrendered soul. And here we have a young kid, a punk kid, who just had his heart set on God. The Bible actually says that he was good looking. He was handsome. He was ruddy, um, which might mean rosy cheeks. It might mean freckles. Some argue he might be a bit of a ranger. At the end of the day, he was kind of good looking. But still, God wasn't so interested in how he looked. It was about his heart. I wonder what that would have been like for for Jesse, the dad. He's brought his seven sons in. He's thinking, oh, great, good news. Good news. The future king of, of Israel is right here. And then hang on, it's none of these seven. Wait. You, 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 we've got one. I've got one kid left, but he's like... He's out, he's out in the field. What, you, you want me to get him, Samuel? You want me, call him, okay. Dave, Dave O, hey, Dave, get here, would you? Come here. Sorry, Samuel, he's, he's out singing again. Mate, put your harp down. No, you can't bring your harp. Put it down. Just come in. No, leave the sheep alone. They'll be just fine. He's always looking after the sheep. He's always doing no, we're not doing another worship thing. I've had enough of these worship sets. He's coming, coming. So David coming. Yeah, Dad. Yeah. David, the least suspecting out of all the sons. He was the youngest. And normally it would go to the, the, the eldest or the second eldest. He's, he's at the bottom of the pile. He's out there looking after the sheep. And, and being a shepherd is not a glorious thing at all. He's looking after the sheep in a family full of shepherds. He's out there still working. He's a servant. We, we read that he's the one that brings out the, the, the cheese board or the crackers or the sandwiches, whatever it might be. He serves the servants. And what's interesting is it says in Psalm chapter 51 that David was a man that was conceived in iniquity. He was conceived in an adulterous relationship. So, so it's, it's extraordinarily likely that David himself was like a half-brother. He was an outcast. He was, he, was, he was born out of wedlock. He was frowned upon. Likely why he wasn't there with all of the other seven. And isn't this such a picture of grace for us? That it was the least. It was the last. It was somewhat of the leftover. It was him that God chose. Why? Because it was him that just had a heart. For God. Friends, I want you to know it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. If your heart is set on him, he can use you incredibly. If you would just be willing and available, he can do some amazing things through you. Here we see Bethlehem, which some argued is a bit of the armpit of that region. And here we have not just the, 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 the place of Bethlehem, but we have the, the shepherd. It was among shepherds that the king of Israel came. And it wasn't just out of shepherds. It was the least of those shepherds, the least in the family, that the future king of Israel was anointed. What a beautiful picture of Jesus. Jesus also came from Bethlehem. This is a foreshadow of Christ, of course. Jesus born in a manger. Jesus, the least of them. Jesus himself was then chosen to be the king of humanity. I want to tell a story about this amazing lady. I want to show on the screen now. Her name is Jackie Pullinger. Jackie Pullinger was born in 1944 in Croydon in the United Kingdom. And at a young age, she gets dramatically saved, has an encounter with Jesus, and at 22 decides she wants to be a missionary. She approaches a number of missionary agencies to which she didn't get any support, but she got counsel from one person just to hop on a boat and see where God took her. She felt she might go to Africa, but she had a dream that she'd end up in Hong Kong. She ends up in Hong Kong at the age of 22 years old, and she starts a ministry in the walled city, not knowing the language, but just being filled with the Spirit and speaking in other tongues. She eventually starts up the St. Stephen's, Society, which provides rehabilitation homes for recovering drug addicts, prostitutes, and gang members. 
She's been doing that for decades and still ministers there to this day. Of what right does a lady in the 50s and 60s not having a plan, not having a strategy, but just having the Holy Spirit, of what right does she have to make such an impact to multitudes of people? Amazing stories of transformation, incredible testimonies. She was just a, she was just a surrendered soul. That's all she was. Never underestimate what God can do with you. Willingness to God and availability to God will get you a long way with God. Now, David, as a young boy, he's not even a young man, he's a young boy. He wasn't yet proven, but he did know the presence. He did know the presence. He knew the presence of God. He would write worship songs. He would sing to God. He would lie in the pastures, looking at the stars and contemplating the greatness of God. His heart was connected to him. And in fact, his heart was committed to God before God anointed him to be king. He was a young boy of integrity who deep in his heart really loved God. God is so very much interested at what's happening inside of you and the state of your heart and of my heart. What happens in you will determine what happens through you. And we can see this with David. God is God's so much more interested in our character than in our career. I, I, I wonder why we spend so much energy and attention and affection on our careers. Our careers can't go with us into eternity. But our character, our character, the who you are of you, the identity... Who you are goes with you for all time. So we're in a season of opportunity to learn and grow on the inside, to let Christ be formed in us. And God is more interested in what's happening inside here, which is why he chose David. Now, we can read that he was anointed at a certain time, but 2 Samuel tells us that he was actually appointed at the age of 30 anointed to be king at about the age of 12 or possibly 13, but appointed to be king at about the age of 30. So what happened within those two bookends? What did he do? Well, after he was anointed to be king, do you know what he didn't do? He didn't Facebook how good he was. He didn't Instagram. He didn't tell everyone, hey, I'm going to be the next greatest king. It's going to be me. Don't you see? You better start listening to me. No, he goes back into the fields and he looks after the sheep. He learns some valuable lessons. We can read that um, he becomes quite skillful in playing the harp or the lyre. He becomes a man of war. He eventually slays Goliath. He becomes prudent in speech, a man of valour. He was a man of good presence. And importantly, the Lord was with him. So all through that time, it was a season of training for him. And his faithfulness was tested. His faithfulness had to develop. I want to talk, if I can, about the greatest basketball player of all time, LeBron James. And coming in as a close second would probably be maybe Wilt Chamberlain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And LeBron James is a beast of a basketball player. But one thing that is strong about these amazing athletes is it's in the small things every single day that they practice, 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 practice. And they are faithful with their craft. Faithfulness, faithfulness. They're faithful with their craft. Faithfulness is is not doing the same thing over time. Faithfulness is doing the right thing over time. So LeBron James wouldn't just play basketball. He would play and practice the right skills over time to become the GOAT, the greatest of all time. You will never find someone that is top of their game or number one in their category by accident. It takes time. And faithfulness has got to be tested. This is what was happening in the life of David. I wonder how many of us out there are in this in-between season of being anointed for a certain task and being appointed for that certain task.
task. Some of you are anointed businessmen and women, but your appointed time has not yet come. Some of you are anointed to be amazing mums and dads, but your time is not yet come. Some of you are anointed to be men and women uh, pastors or leaders, but your appointed time has not yet come. Some of you out there may be anointed to be the next premier or the prime minister of this nation, but your time has not yet come. Perhaps now this is a season for faithfulness to develop. See, if we take care of our faithfulness, God will take care of our fruitfulness. Look forward for those opportunities to be faithful. Don't focus on the fruit. Focus on faithfulness. And it could be those little small opportunities, that small, those small windows every day that you see in front of you. I remember a number of years ago, there was a, a leader in our church and he said to me, hey, Josh, I really feel called to uh, preach in church. I said, do you? He goes, yeah, I feel, I feel called. I feel the anointing to preach in church. I said, fantastic. I said, how about you preach to our kids in our children's ministry? He says, what? I said, yeah, preach in the children's ministry. He says, well, no, I don't feel called to do that. I feel to be called to preach to adults. I said, well, maybe, but right here, right now, this is where the need is. As it turns out, he turned the roll down. Didn't end up preaching in our church. What opportunities are presented to you right now? What little windows are presented for you to see your faithfulness develop? It, 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 it might be something small, and for you perhaps it's a small thing. Don't despise the small things we can read in Zechariah. Before you want to save the world, how about saving your neighbour? Before you want to clean up the landfill in Australia, how about you clean up your backyard or the park down the road? See, for me, I'm challenged because I want to have a great, healthy, vibrant church. But God challenges me, son, have a healthy, vibrant household and a healthy, vibrant family at home first. It always starts in your own backyard. It always starts with what's within your grasp. What's within your grasp? See, fruitfulness is something that God brings. We can't really be fruitful outside of Him. It comes by the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Have we got any fruiterers out there? Anyone that likes fruit? And um, Pastor Scott will give you 10 bucks if you can guess what my favourite fruit is. <laughs> Feel free to drop it in the, section, the comment section if you're on Facebook Live or YouTube. My favourite fruit is, drum roll please, I love chilli. Being an Indian man, I love my chilli very much. I'll put it with my eggs for chilli eggs for breakfast. I'll have it with mushrooms. I'll put it with my ham sandwich for lunch. I'll put it with my curry for dinner. I'll sprinkle it on my ice cream for dessert. I tell you, I love chilli. And when we look at a chilli plant or any fruit plant for that matter, if fruit is not growing right, you don't just look at the fruit. You've got to look at the root system. You've got to look at the soil. You've got to look at what's happening beneath the surface. If the root system's healthy, the fruit system will be healthy. The same thing is for us. If the heart system is healthy, everything else becomes healthy. Jesus spoke to this in John chapter 15, actually. And uh, verse 4, Jesus says, Abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. Verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. What do you mean, Jesus, I can do nothing? Of course I can do stuff. You know I can do stuff without you. Jesus isn't saying that you can do nothing at all. He's saying you can do nothing of value. You can't bear fruit and fruit that remains. This is a work of the Spirit. You can get results. You can get stuff done without Him, but you can only see fruit produced as you are planted in Him because this is a work of the Spirit that comes out of intimacy. 
In fact, it was Heidi Baker that once said, all fruitfulness flows from intimacy. So we focus on the faithfulness. God takes care of the fruitfulness. And I wonder if I can brag a little bit about my mum. My mama, when I think about faithfulness, I can't help but think about her. I remember growing up as a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old boy before I started going to school, and I would see my mum, observe my mum, and listen to my mum as she's cleaning the house, doing the washing, taking care of my younger brother and sister at the time, and listening to uh, Don Moen play. And Maranatha, those old songs. Oh, geez, they don't write them like they used to. And so as she's worshipping God, as she's singing those songs, she's hanging out the washing. She's cleaning up the floors. And she's faithful day in, day out. Remember, faithfulness is not just doing the same thing day in, day out. It's doing the right thing day in, day out. And our faithfulness gets tested. Our character can deepen in the seemingly mundane looking after the sheep that David did. What's your here and now or what's your mundane, your everyday? It's your everyday that can get turned into a one day or a someday. And we see that about David. He's appointed as, he's anointed as king and he goes back to the sheep, looking after those daggy, daggy sheep. Eventually he's appointed as king, but that's quite a number of years later. But God tests him and he realises that if this is a young man that I can trust to look after sheep, I'll give him a different type of sheep. I'll give him a sheep nation. Faithful in little, faithful in much. Whatever season you're in right now, may you apprehend what the Holy Spirit is saying to you and wanting to do through you now in this season. What about this season of COVID at the moment? There seems to be some separation. There seems to be some isolation that's happening. It's really uncomfortable. It's really disturbing and disrupting a whole lot of things. There's this amazing sifting that's going on. But I wonder if there's an opportunity for some sort of a new normal to be birthed from this season, that our faithfulness of kindness and compassion might develop and that our faithfulness would deepen in this season, that perhaps from this season there are some new normal things that we're to make as part of our rhythm every single day. As a church, we've started adopting a whole new range of strategies that we've talked about for years and we're really seeing. We're seeing 30-odd chaplains now committing to people that are not in life groups, committing to these people to pray for them, to keep tabs on them, make sure everyone's okay. We're seeing community endeavours and outreach increase pretty much exponentially. We're seeing people come to us, offer for help like we've never seen before. It's almost like we're having to find jobs for people to outreach and see the mission mobilised in a greater capacity. Perhaps this is the new normal. We're seeing people getting saved over the internet. We're seeing people come back to faith through the internet. Perhaps this is the new normal. We're seeing God stories of people having deeper sense of connection with God in this season. Perhaps this is a new normal. Let's not try and endure this season. Why not enjoy it? In fact, James 1 tells us, count it all joy when you go through. There are opportunities to endure. So we can actually enjoy as we endure. It is possible. Jesus endured the cross, but for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Enjoyment and enduring can work together. So in the season, I understand we want to get through it. Let me just get through it. I can't wait till this is over with. Don't miss the opportunity to learn from God or hear from God or be growing in God in this moment. This is where our faithfulness can deepen. And as we focus on the faithfulness, let him take care of the fruitfulness. Now, it's going to be pretty tricky sometimes because we're going to have to understand how to wait in this holding pattern between God anointing us and God appointing us, God recognising what's happening within and God releasing what's happening within. But be patient. God's timing is always on time. We should never short-circuit a work of the Spirit. Let's not rush Him. We, let's trust His delays. It's, it's, it's tricky though, right? Because we are a microwave generation dealing with a crockpot God. 
And we want everything to be instantaneous in the here and the now. And in, in, in if I just put my offering in, we treat God like some sort of celestial vending machine. All right, here, I'm going to put it in. God, there, I've done my prayer. I've put my offering in. I've, I've, si- I've read my Bible verse and I want you to come and give me what I want right now. I've, I place the order in. Or, or we pick up a genie lamp expecting God the genie to come out. Or we, 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 we rub the lamp the right way and we half expect God to come out. Yes, Master, here at your service. We somehow think he's, he's there at our beck and call. No, God loves us too much to give us what we want all of the time. At times he's going to say, hey, take a chill pill, just relax. My timing is perfect. My watch, it's different to yours. I understand it's tricky. I've got some kids at home and um, I'm trying to teach them about patience Dad, I want to do cooking. Let me do cooking now, now. Let me do cooking now, now. We can do that a little bit. No, 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 no. Stop asking me that. No, I want to do it now. And so I try to teach them that patience is not just about waiting. Patience is about waiting well. It's about waiting with the right attitude. And that's the same thing for us as God's kids. Just because we wait around doesn't mean we're exercising patience. Patience can develop when opportunities for impatience is brought to the surface and dealt with. So God gives us these opportunities and he might at times show us what's in the future and we've got to trust him, not just the outcome. And this we see with David. Having mature faith in God is always having faith in God for his timing. So let's remember that whatever season we're in, whatever that season is, it's a valuable one. And every season is an opportunity to sow. Not just reap, but sow. This season that we're in right now, let's keep sowing. Let's sow goodness. Let's sow generosity. Let's sow love. Let's sow kindness. Let's sow grace. Let's sow mercy. Let's sow Jesus as much as we can. And let's just be faithful in this season so he can do what he wants to do. What season are you in right now? Are you frustrated right now in the season that you're in? Maybe you've got this amazing picture of the future that God has given to you. You know that you know that you know that there's something on the other side. Let's not rush to get there. Let's enjoy this moment in this season, not just endure, but enjoy. Thank God, I thank you that I'm in this. What are you trying to say to me now? What are you trying to teach me now? Because you value my character more than my career. You value who I am more than what I can do. I want to pray for us in this moment, just as we finish. And I want us to pray, if we can, for those of us that feel like we're stuck within the bookends of anointing and appointing. The season of in-between. It can be really frustrating, but it's some of the most powerful seasons that God can place us in because we learn about Him and ourselves. And it's a season of preparation. If you're here this morning and this applies to you, I want us, if we can, just to perhaps raise our hands as an act of surrender to God. And we're going to pray for His grace to come just now and to give us strength, but also discernment in this season. Perhaps you've never done this prayer before. Perhaps you want to give your life to Jesus and say yes to Him. Or perhaps you feel like you've once walked with Him but don't anymore. If that's you, feel free to join in on this prayer right now. Let's pray for this together, can we? Father, for those of us in this family that um, maybe not in this family just yet, but we're here and we're trying to get a sense for what you're doing. For those of us that feel like we might be stuck in this in-between season, may we not try and rush the process, but may we trust your process. Help us to see your, your face in the middle of this. Help us to trust your leading in this, the empowerment of your Holy Spirit in this. Help us to trust what you're wanting to do. And for those of us that are here just now that don't yet know you, I pray we say yes to Jesus, that we receive forgiveness, that we receive life eternal, that we don't just add you to our life, but we replace you with our life. We thank you, Jesus, for overcoming the cross and overcoming the grave for us. And I pray, Father, Lord, may we have discernment as a community like the sons of Issachar, to even be aware and discern the times and the seasons that we're in, even right now.
We thank you, Father, for what you're saying to us, what you're doing within us and what you're still to do. We thank you, Father, for salvation visiting our hearts and our homes this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, wasn't that a great service? Oh, yeah. yeah, I really wonder what God was trying to say to you guys in that time. Yeah, and remember, whatever season you are in, God is in it with you. And He has a higher purpose for that. Yeah, and if you're out there and you don't know who Jesus is, or you'd like more information, or you would even like to give your life to Jesus, email us at yes at gracelife.com.au.